Hello there. Today we're going to discuss something that's going to be useful for you regardless of your level. Uh, how do you end your improvised phrases? And more importantly, how do you get away with a whole bunch of mistakes? Just like I tried doing here. Uh, and the answer to this question uh, is a pretty cool answer uh, because it's something you can use regardless if your runs are technical and fast or if you're just making your first steps in the pentatonic scale. Um, so in this example, I'm playing in the J, G minor pentatonic scale, the third, the third position here, third fret. You've seen that a million times. Um, and when I played, um, well, I, I consciously tried to be a bit adventurous, so I played a, rather, a lot of wrong notes. <laughs> and the reality of it is that most of the times these notes sound kind of bad unless you clean up afterwards. So that means you hit some bad notes and then you land on good notes. I've told you that a million times. Um, and in this case, uh, the strong or the good notes are found in the G minor pentatonic scale. You can also find some strong notes in the G major pentatonic scale. But that's not something we're going to discuss today. Okay, so how do you play something that's random and that's wrong and still make it sound good? Well, you have to end your phrases in a musical way. So how do you end your phrases in a musical way? Well, this approach is something I got from um, John Schofield. Um, I'm not really sure, no, I don't know a whole lot about him or I don't know a whole lot about jazz, uh, but I like listening to his stuff and I can hear that um, he, one of his trademarks um, is the fact that he, well, he plays a lot uh, with timing and really plays around the beat and behind the beat. So he's not spot on all the time, like a computer. No one really wants to be like that. Instead, he's sort of floating around the beat, and that's something Marty Friedman does a lot as well. Um, so let's look at that, and um, also how we can get some cool dynamics going on with, dynamics going on with the right hand. Okay, so... So if you can play that after a long run, it's going to sound good. Even if the, ro the run is pretty horrible. Even worse, let's just play the wrong pentatonic scale. Still sounds pretty okay to me. Uh, some more random chromatics. Okay, uh, so the idea, you've heard it before, play something wrong and then play something right. And this time we're going to look at what I'm doing when I'm trying to play something right. Well, first of all, I am slowing down the pace. So instead of playing on the beat, I am sort of pushing myself to be a little bit behind the beat. Um, and uh, the way you should practice this is to, you know, exaggerate it and really feel how you play completely behind the beat and then try to adjust that so that it's not quite as bad. And when you're sort of starting to find the sweet spot, uh, then the next step is to really practice to go in and out of, you know, the, the beat. Um, and if you do this in combination with some uh, Schofield kind of picking dynamics where you actively think about moving your pick or even your fingers if you play with your fingers um, in this direction on the string and you're gonna get big tonal differences. For example, playing close to the bridge. That's so Schofield to me. And move it 
to here. This is a bit more standard. So if you go alternate between these positions and find all the in-betweens, uh, then you can get some interesting phrases without really coming up with any new licks here, just uh, by introducing some tonal variation with this technique. Of course, um, this, I'm doing this in combination with you know, playing with dynamics. So you might have noticed I was, went really soft there with the pick uh, while I also went in this direction. So I got a decrease in dynamics and I got an increase in uh, brightness because you get a more bright sound when you play close to the bridge. And all these things matter. So if you think, you know, if you're having problems sounding like your hero, it doesn't matter if it's Schofield or someone else, uh, then it's a good thing to understand that these tiny nuances by themselves don't make a big difference. But when you start combining them and understanding what they do, uh, then they are the biggest tone shapers you can think about. Much more important than what gear you're playing on. So on, try to understand these things, because this is what really matters at the end. You don't need a lot of uh, expensive equipment. You need understanding for this kind of stuff. So if I combine all that with playing around the beat, then we get something that to me sounds a bit uh, Schofield-ish. And that's pretty much what I went for in this jammed solo, or improvised solo. Uh, so let's try one more time with the backing track, and I'm going to see if, if I can try to make it clear how I go you know, play around the rhythm or around the beat while also thinking about these things I just spoke about. try with our fingers, the effect will be even more noticeable. Okay, so let's see if we can go in and out of the um, rhythm-wise. So on the beat, with a bit of a swing feeling. That's pretty much on the beat. So let's start with that and then try to go behind the beat. <laughs> I really made it uh, to the point that I changed beat subdivision. But don't really care about that. Just think of it as, did I slow down? Yes. So that's what you should try to do as well. Try to slow down and then get back up to tempo. It doesn't matter what the theoretical description of what you're doing is. You know, whether you're playing behind the beat, you're finding the pocket, or whether you're changing sub note subdivision. What matters is, how does it sound? Am I slowing down? Yes. Am I going back up to tempo? Yes. So we're doing it. You should do the same. Can you hear how I slowed down and I caught, caught up again? I'm exaggerating the dynamics a little bit there, but you can still see here hopefully how it affects the tone. So in essence, that's it. Um, that's how I approach this solo. And of course, uh, I, I haven't been playing my guitar for a bunch of days, so it was easier for me to play this kind of stuff rather than going for the shreddy stuff. Uh, but this is a style I like a lot and it's just a way to create interesting phrases and dynamics out of your mistakes pretty much. <laughs> Uh, so that's what I try to do and hopefully you can do the same here by using these approaches. And if you got some shops, that's great. Play your licks and then when ending them, start thinking about this kind of stuff. It's also, uh, especially the playing around the, the beat is really useful if you learn that because it's a way to save your ass when you're uh, in a situation where you've fallen and you don't know where you are in the rhythm, then you just sort of slow down until you find you know, the beat again. And you pretty much make it, can make it sound intentional if you have been practicing the things I've been showing you here. Okay, so I hope this is helpful. And remember, uh, 
this is not something you need a lot of uh, playing experience from. Uh, you just need to start feeling where the beat is and then try to experiment with that and move your pick. No shops needed, no, no super techniques or whatever. So you should do this now. And I, there's a link to the backing track uh, below. So check it out if you want. Uh, and uh, you can also just jam with me in this video because there's a lot of uh, spaces in the video. I'm just playing the G minor pentatonic scale. And until next time, have a good one. Cheers. Bye.